I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. Brace yourself. This is... Yow! Warn me before you do that so I can take these things out. <coughs> of all the amazing creatures to be found in the deep ocean, few are as misunderstood or misrepresented by Hollywood more precisely than the jellies. Let's look at the scene. This thing has deliberately come up to the surface and grabbed onto the ship so it can drag it down. What's wrong with this? They don't move on their own. They can't because they don't have a brain. They have a rudimentary central nervous system that enables them to gather food that wanders into their tentacles. Why would one of any size do this? The ship isn't edible and that rudimentary central nervous system can tell. If it's not something to eat, jellies don't bother with it. I don't know of any that would have a reason to do this. Those tentacles, even in one that size, don't have the strength to drag something down like this. To capture food, jellyfish depend on stingers in the tentacles to either kill or paralyze the prey. Then the tentacles can use a combination of nudging it along and playing the water currents to get the food to its orifice. So other than the fact that it's both impossible and unlikely, this is believable. Lost without warning. I can't blame my skipper, Admiral. The ocean was calm. There was no reason to expect a sudden squall would hit us. If we hadn't been on deck or found that life raft, I don't know what would have happened. Several other people didn't have life rafts, but we'll only mention them in passing since they're not the ones that matter. Uh, ju just what was this project you were working on, Dr. Hales? Something of great significance. The life cycle of plankton is what is reported here. That's a press release to cover the true nature of my work. Since every other living thing on the planet depends on healthy plankton in one way or another, that seems pretty important to me. Only Miss Simmons and I know the truth. And now I'd like you to know, because I need you. I need you to help me rescue the most incredible scientific discovery in history. Every other week he has somebody come to him and say that. Whatever it is, Nelson will take the sea view to go help him recover it. Lee, what's going on? We weren't supposed to put out to sea for another five days. Well, I don't know much more about it than you do, Chip. The Admiral alerted me and said we were going to take a couple of scientists out to where they lost their ship. Oh, sure. That story that was in all the papers must be a big deal. Mm -hmm. Big enough for the Admiral to change our sailing orders. You better set your special sea detail. Right, Things get even more puzzling when Ames brings the lady on board with him. Sailors have always been funny about women on board. Even worse, they know she's quite attractive, but nobody's allowed to get a look at her. Uh, do you, uh, do you really believe that story of his? Don't you? He said his ship was sunk by a squall. Now I had Sparks contact three ships who were in the area, and no one reported so much as a ripple. Sudden storms do happen out in the open sea, but they tend to be bigger than one ship. Oh, why don't you drop them, Riley? Good idea. Oh, no. Give me a hand, will you? Sure, you got it. Good job, Riley. One of those papers appears to be the start of a science fiction story. You know that dream you brought on board by the secretary? Well, this paper... <laughs> This paper says she's over 200 years old. How does Ames know this? Was he there? <laughs> sure. And I'm Secretary of the Navy. I swear, Stu, it's the truth. Listen. <laughs> Living proof of the power of the Vita synthesis. The which? I don't know, some kind of drug or something. Now listen. Although Carol Simmons has the face 
body and tissue tone of a healthy 20-year-old female. He can say that again. She is, in reality, over 200 years old. It also says if she doesn't get regular doses of the stuff, she'll age rapidly and die within hours of when the last dose wears off. So, without her, she's a basic Hollywood trope. Vita synthesis can literally restore youth. That's an old dream, Doctor. Ponce de Leon, the fountain of youth, all that. You don't understand, Admiral. It's not a dream. It's a reality. And that's why we must recover those notes and samples. And if we can? We must. The work could never be duplicated. Why? He says, much of the formula went down with my colleagues on the ship, so the information in my safe is all there is. He almost seems desperate. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, you never explained in detail about that squall that signed your ship. There's nothing to explain. It came up suddenly. Blew itself out shortly. Oh, I thought it must have been something like that. Those uh, line squalls can be pretty tricky. Translation, I know you're lying, but I'll let it pass for now. Who is it? Breakfast, Miss Simmons. Put it by the door and I'll get it later. But we did that with your dinner, miss, and you didn't touch it. Aren't you hungry? I'll take it. They asked for this detail, hoping to get a peek at her. Keep hoping, gentlemen, but she wouldn't want you to see her in her present condition anyway. Aren't we ever going to get there? It's only a matter of hours. Everything will be all right. How can you be so sure? You should have told Admiral Nelson what really happened. No. He might have refused to risk a submarine. We did the right thing. The right thing for whom? Not for the sub and her crew, that's for sure. They're getting weird readings on all their instruments. Count to dead slow. Dead slow? How far are you from the wreck? About a half an hour. But sonar's been acting up. You said we were a half hour away. That's not Ames' ship. We've been passing these wrecks for ten minutes. This thing seems to get its jollies dragging ships to the bottom. Captain Crane doesn't know that, so they're sailing right into the potential to become more jelly jollies. We've uh, seen sunken ships before. But not so many together, without explanation. Head up to the surface and look for more of those little one-ship squalls that Ames described. Maybe they're a regular thing here. can line these cavities where the electronics go with aluminum foil and it will shield this thing from stuff like that. Why isn't the sea view coated in it? Skipper. Sonar's going haywire. Something's jammed our radio gear. Engine room to control. Malfunction on electronic tachometers. They're going crazy. They're not alone. The whole boat is going crazy. Everything electronic is acting as though it's drunk. Eventually, they drift past the critter and things return to normal. They've reached Ames's ship. He's all excited to get over there and get his miracle stuff. Why aren't we stopping? Captain Crane is holding off. He wants to know, as I do, what really sank your ship. If I told you the truth, there might have been delays. You might have even refused to come. I'll tell you what really happened later. Right now, there's no time to be wasted getting to the Vita Synthesis. Uh, if I'm either of those gents, you'll tell us now. Because nothing is going to happen until you do, and we can sit here for days if you push it. He is really making me want to stuff a bar of soap in his mouth. He's acting as though he can overrule the captain of the vessel. I have news for him. The captain is as close to an all-powerful deity as you'll see, and that's true on any ship, sub, yacht, or dinghy that goes to sea. As a rule, even though Nelson outranks Crane, Crane is the captain and his word is law that even Nelson can't defy without good reason. Robert Loggia didn't decide to become an actor until his early 20s, but when he did, he hit the ground running. 
From 1955 to his death in 2015, he worked his incredibly talented butt off. He had a degree in journalism, and I suspect that came in handy when he was sorting out how to research a role. The first step in something like that is knowing what questions to ask, so he had a bit of an advantage over some other actors in that regard. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2010, and it took him from us five years later. He left us an amazing legacy, and his talent is on full display here. By the end of the episode, you'll want to punch this guy as much as I did, even when you know why he did it. Don't worry, all will become clear. By the way, he just admitted he lied to them. That's grounds enough for Crane to pull the plug right now and dare Ames to do something about it. I trust that answers your question, gentlemen. Crane orders them to back out of there, but it takes a long time to stop a sub that size and get it going the other way. As I said, it has no reason to do this. It can't even feel threatened. There's no brain circuit in it to do that. The sea view isn't food and it can tell. Now, if one of those enormous sawfish we've seen before was to come by, that would be a meal worthy of this guy. Because it's not made of metal. The sea view's force shield is enough to drive it off, but Captain Crane says we're getting out of here. Now we know it sank those ships. What is that thing? Whatever it is, it produces electrical shockwaves. No, miss. Damage control reports minor hull damage. Our electrical gear shot and force field is no longer operational. How soon can we get out of here? 20 minutes. What do you mean, get out of here? Just that, Doctor. We have to get back to port to make repairs. Not without getting the Vita synthesis. That's not your decision, Ames. Sit down. With minor repairs, we might be able to get back in a week. A week? Everything would be ruined. What will be ruined? What's he talking about? We know what he means, but I don't understand why he won't tell them that Carol's life is on the line. You brought it on yourself, Doctor. It's my fault and it's done. But I beg you, give me an hour and the men I need to get to that wreck. The answer is no. Captain Crane's first job is the safety of the boat and crew. Everything else takes a back seat, especially when this dingbat won't tell him what's going on. So naturally, Ames is going to do something stupid. manages to overpower the crewman and knock him out. Nobody knows he's outside, so the sub is getting underway. This is the captain. The mission's aborted. We're returning to Santa Barbara. We're returning to Santa Barbara. The mission's aborted. Neither she nor Ames is giving the least thought to the danger they're posing for over a hundred men. It's all about her and only her. Look, I love being alive as much as anybody, but if it comes down to a question of who loses, me or a hundred other people, that's a no-brainer. I'll prepare to shake hands with Jesus. Cut engines in 30 seconds, then full aft on starboard, full ahead on port. I want as quick a turn as we can get. Skipper, this is Missile Room Watch. Go ahead, Missile Room. Dr. Ames is down here. He took a wetsuit and I tried to stop him, but he knocked me out. Now he's disappeared. Also a no-brainer. Check the airlock and you'll know where he went. All stop. All stop. Who's that? Ames, of course. I'll say one thing, he's got guts. This is the captain. Get the diving party out. I want Ames back aboard at once. Aye, sir. Admiral, can you come down to the control room? Dr. Ames is on the outside. Chip said he has guts. That big jellyfish thinks his guts look good to eat even though sea jellies don't have eyes.
They also don't make noise like that, and they don't have mouths. So aside from moving on its own, dragging ships down because it's fun, growling like a tiger through a mouth that isn't there, throwing out electric charges and chasing humans, this thing is totally authentic. Well done, Irwin. Ames manages to hide under some rocks where the monster can't get at him. Crane calls the dive team back. There's nothing they can do. So now my question becomes, how much air is in that tank he's wearing? On the sea view, they realize they need to find a way to drive this thing away. How are we going to save him? I don't know. We can't use a torpedo. The concussion would kill him. Forgive me for this, but he says that like it's a bad thing. How about using the sea view as bait to draw that thing away? No, that I reduce speed. It would spot the motion and be on us in a flash. The flying sub? <laughs> Missile room. Prepare the torpedo for firing and stand by for instructions. Crane takes the flying sub out, hoping to get the creature's attention and lure it away from Ames. He needs to swoop close enough for it to detect him and try to chase him. Too close. A little too close. All the systems are shorted out, and the flying sub drops to the bottom, helpless. I'm all right, Admiral. Good. But don't make any unnecessary sounds. That thing is right on top of you. I'm not planning on leaving. But the only thing left working is a radio. Nothing on the radio. No. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. No. May I continue? Mother, please. I'd rather do it myself. Admiral, the, uh, the batteries are generating gas. In another ten minutes, I won't be able to breathe this air. Well, get into scuba gear. That might hold you until we can do something about it. He'll need to gear up anyway to get out of there once they find a way to chase that monster away. But he accomplished his mission. That thing is focusing on him now, which gives Ames a chance to swim back to the sea view. And what kind of a fool stunt was that? I've got to rescue the samples and records from my ship. I'm the only one who can decipher those records. Well, thanks to you, Crane is trapped out there. I'm indispensable. Captain Crane is not. Excuse me? Captain Crane is the heart and soul of this boat. You're some guy who thinks he's important. As far as I'm concerned, the attention of every man on this ship will be concentrated on saving Captain Crane. Is that clear? Maybe if he bothered to explain why that stuff is so important to him, they might be able to work something out. But he really thinks they should all recognize him as the ultimate authority here because he says so. It's unfortunate, Admiral, we don't share the same sense of values. And what does that mean? Tell them something you nitwit. Nelson values human life above all else. If you tell him there's a human life at stake here, it will make a difference. This guy is killing Carol with arrogance. Of course he did. He's a highly trained, highly intelligent idiot. Actually, that's probably not fair. He's obsessed. It's easy to see that he's in love with her and is willing to keep her alive no matter the cost. People in that state of mind can be the most dangerous folks you ever saw. It's a normal-sized variation of the one that's threatening the flying sub. Wait a minute. So what is that thing? Whatever it is, it produces electrical shockwaves. None of them knows what it is, but he found a smaller one anyway. Sure, Jan. He's experimenting with turning its electrical charge back onto itself. The Sea View has a parabolic dish that can do that nicely with a little tweaking. Patterson. Yes, sir. We're going to try to drive off the man of war and get to the skipper. Once he's back aboard, we'll fire the torpedo, but not before. The concussion would kill him. Aye, sir. But Ames has other ideas. He's holding Patterson at gunpoint. Now run the torpedo into the firing tube. The torpedo stays where it is until the skipper's back on board. I'd advise you to do as I say. 
he does have some limits, like he's not willing to shoot an unarmed man in the back. Instead, he knocks Patterson out, studies the controls, and inserts the torpedo himself. And now we know how far Patterson will go to protect his captain. He fully expected to die. But he's become a regular cast member, so he's not allowed to. It's in his contract. Nelson, this is Ames. I'm locked in the missile room. There's a torpedo in the number one tube. I can fire it, but aiming it is up to you. Switch to intercom. If you fire that torpedo, Crane will be killed. I told you once, Crane is expendable. You're not the one who gets to decide that. I would hope there are some controls on the bridge that can lock him out of the firing mechanism. Now, this is your choice, Admiral. Either you do as I say, or I'll destroy the Sea View and everyone in it. That's always the threat. I'll blow myself and everyone else up. This helps your girlfriend. How? He's rigged one of the other torpedo warheads with a timer. They have ten minutes to destroy the creature, which they're now calling a man of war. Man of wars live on the surface, and they're not individual critters, they're collectives like coral. But as we know, Irwin never let reality get in the way of a good story. Or this one. He's doing what you told him to. Shut up and stop interrupting. He's getting the full force with on discharge. More important, the discharge is having the desired effect. It's moving away. Lee. It's been driven off. Now's your chance. You don't have to tell him twice. He's out of there. Come in through the engine room hatch, not the missile room. Ames is there, armed and dangerous. In fact, he's out of there so fast, he didn't hear that. Disobeyed me, Nelson, but I'm grateful. Crane's in his scuba gear. He can get to my ship and bring back my discovery. Dude, give it up. At the very least, he'll need to change tanks, which is going to take your whole ten minutes. Captain Crane says the timer is running. I don't have much choice. But his face says he's looking for a way to stall and get the drop on this guy. <laughs> It's attacking. Don't go out. Engine room, full of stern, evasive action, emergency. Never mind what Nelson's doing. You get to my ship or you die now. If he goes out there, he's equally dead and you still don't have your stuff. Duh. I was wrong. He is an idiot. Clark Wright ready. Aye, sir. Oh, it's not you, sir. We don't have enough speed. Yourselves. Captain Crane gets to the controls and fires the torpedo. That thing is finally dead. Get away from that torpedo. The torpedo's dead. It's dead, the torpedo is dead, and one other. Can we still get to my ship? I said no delay. It's value to the world, to humanity. Sir, Miss Simmons wants to see Dr. Ames. It's urgent. What's the matter with you? Nothing. It's too late, it doesn't matter anymore. He's been going on and on about what a benefit to humanity this stuff is, but when it's too late to save his lady friend, it doesn't matter anymore. So his great and noble altruism extended to exactly one person. The rest of us can go jump. 
What's too late? Carol. She was my guinea pig. I created her, but I made one mistake. I fell in love with her. He goes to her cabin and she dies in his arms, looking 200 years old. And he still won't tell anybody anything. Specifically, he isn't more than about 40. How did he create a 200-year-old person? How did she survive the other 160 years? Are we subtly saying he is also 200 years old? And if so, why isn't he affected the way she is? We get nothing. He says he wants to benefit mankind, but when it doesn't benefit his girl, he says forget it. They don't know what the monster is, but Nelson found a little one. I came away from this episode saying, what the frickety frack was that? I did enjoy Robert Loggia's performance. He was convincing enough, but he should have read the script a little more closely before he took the role because this thing is a turkey. Speaking of creatures, many of you have mentioned in the comments how the show descended into a Monster of the Week pattern, much like Lost in Space did. It's not there yet, but based on this, it shows promise. I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space, I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I gotta do is breathe underwater. Cantana da 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 affected the sways. Come on, we have one to go.